Dzień dobry. My name is Rob and I am learning everything about Poland. Now, after the world wars, it seems like there is a lot of movement, displacement and a lot of after effects. So in today's video, we're going to see what happened between the Poles and the Soviets after World War One. And if you do enjoy this video, go down there, hit the like button and subscribe for more. In the aftermath of the First World War, new countries emerged as quickly as old ones fell apart. The Russian, German, and Austro-Hungarian empires collapsed all at once. The Russian Civil War, which had started in 1917, was in full swing by 1919, and the Communist Red Army in Russia had largely routed the anti-Bolshevik White Army. Fearing the revolution would continue spilling into neighboring states, Poland sent forces to the Russo-Polish border. Though so with my generation coming up, I'm 34 coming up at the end of this month, I don't really know that much about World War I. I know a lot more about what happened in World War II and a little bit of the afters. But I know next to nothing other than what happened in Blackadder Goes Forth um, and the brief bits, you know, about them playing football at Christmas and things. I don't really know a lot about what happened during or after World War One. Um, so it's really interesting to know about this from these videos. I think it's a generational thing. Uh, I don't think I think my era will focus more on World War Two. Uh, maybe the era or two before me would focus more on World War I. Um, but as time moves on, I think your f the focus on teaching changes as well. But in this sense, uh, the Russians, basically, the, w the war happened. It was exhausting for everyone. Um, a lot of land was taken. The Russians thought, oh, I love that. And that's what they did. But the Poles... Got a little bit worried thinking actually the Russians, are, the Soviets are going to try and keep going left. No, no one really knows how exactly the Polish-Soviet war started. Most believe it was a gradual escalation, eventually leading to a large-scale Polish offensive after several skirmishes with communist partisans. By the end of 1919, the Poles had pushed as far as Vilnius and Minsk in the north and had taken a large swath of western Ukraine, all with very little resistance, as the Russians were simply not prepared to defend themselves against a Polish incursion in the midst of civil war. The Poles, under leadership of Józef Polutski, quickly formed an alliance with what was left of Ukraine and launched yet another offensive in April of 1920. They it almost seems like the Poles, you know, for all they know, for all the Polish know, the Russians weren't going to go any further. Maybe they would, maybe they weren't. I, I don't know. So it seems like the Poles sort of wanted to act first. You know, he can't hit me first if I hit him first, if that makes sense. Um, and that's probably why they were able to take such a large amount of ground, because maybe the Russians weren't necessarily planning on going any further or they weren't ready to go any further. Uh, it's interesting. They again encountered very little resistance and even took the Ukrainian capital of Kiev in early May. That's a but lot. then they stopped. Polish forces had no capacity to move further. The Polish and Ukrainian forces had to walk hundreds of miles with almost no vehicles and barely enough horses to carry supplies. The new occupiers of Kiev were exhausted, barely equipped, and hundreds of miles away from reinforcements. The Poles in the northeastern end of the border were not much better off. They too had stretched supply lines, with only 120,000 men and 460 artillery pieces spread along an open and indefensible frontier. Uh, you can see here, they've, they've basically gone and taken a whole new country back. Um, you know, if you look at the size of, of Poland itself, they've almost taken another Poland. And... I don't know what uh, what is the what was the aim of this. You know, they could say, for example, pushing into Ukraine. It's it's to get Ukraine back. Um, you know, but what's the aim of of, of pushing into Russia? Because Russia wasn't Poles anyway, was it? So, I I don't know how much of a just cause this was at this point. I'm not sure. They were extremely vulnerable. 
By now, Moscow had had enough. After months of a slow buildup, the Red Army had about 300,000 men with an ample supply of artillery that were ready for deployment. That is a lot more. Red Army commander and eventual ice pick repository, Leon Trotsky, ordered a two-prong attack. He sent Joseph Stalin to the south to retake Kiev and then move further west into Ukrainian territory. Meanwhile, Tukhachevsky was to attack from the north and retake Belarus. Total numbers are hard to come by, but Soviet forces in these two attacks numbered around 300,000 and were split evenly between Stalin and Tukhachevsky. Tukhachevsky's army of 160,000 men pushed west in early July 1920. He brought along more than 700 artillery pieces and wow. almost 3,000 machine guns, wow. far outgunning any Polish defenders. Meanwhile, in the south, most of the fighting was done by the 1st Cavalry Army, comprised exclusively of men crazy enough to still fight on horseback even after World War I. They swung around Kiev and captured the city of Brody, far behind the Polish in the first week of August. They then planned to move quickly to Lviv. Stalin's infantry was slower, but they made great advances as well. But how did the Russians turn the tide so quickly? Was it not sheer numbers? By the looks of it, and by what, what the, the narrator's saying, the Soviets, when they, when they sort of regrouped and thought, yeah, we're not having this, their numbers were huge compared to the Polish and Ukrainians. So that's surely that's how they were able to, to push the Poles back so quickly. Just sheer numbers of, of units and uh, weapons. Surely it wouldn't be that difficult. Well, the initial Russian attack was successful due to a combination of three major factors. First was superior numbers. Second was the said. fact that the Polish were at the end of their supply lines. They were exhausted. And third was the disorganized state of the Polish army, having received most of its equipment from other countries. While the Russians weren't extremely well organized either, they were at least able to supply most of their troops sufficiently, at least for now. While the original Russian plan was to just take back the Ukraine and territory that Poland had occupied, Tukhachevsky pushed on. The energetic and opportunistic general believed that the proletariat would rise up wherever Russian troops arrived. He planned to destroy the Polish army in the north, take Warsaw, and then spread the communist revolution into Germany. The political leaders of Moscow were a little more cautious, fearing retaliation from non-communist European powers. On the other hand, they were also afraid of confronting Tukhachevsky, lest he turn on them. Tukhachevsky was relentless and kept up a murderous speed, never allowing the Polish army to rest, regroup, or organize a defense. But I think I, I said I just from this narration, it's it's still giving me the thought that actually the Poles started it, and you know the Poles were going to take Russian land. And can you blame the Russians for wanting to take Polish land? And yes, they're spreading, you know, the Soviet message, basically. But from what I've learned already, you know, most Poles never wanted the Soviets there. They didn't want to live under that regime. But I'm just wondering, you know, whose fault is this? The poor logistical consideration took a toll on Tukhachevsky's force. Large numbers of casualties were sustained, and many soldiers who couldn't keep up with the advance were simply left behind. Wow. The soldiers That's who brutal. did keep up had to defend a long and outstretched perimeter while still pushing west. By the time the attack commenced on Warsaw, Tukhachevsky only had 50,000 men ready for the assault of his original 160,000. Wow. What's worse, Stalin, after receiving contradictory Victory orders refused to send the 1st Cavalry Army to Warsaw, keeping them stationed in Lviv. More troops were siphoned off when Tukhachevsky was ordered to send reinforcements to Crimea, as Stalin was hung up in Lviv, and the entire 4th Army was cut out of the picture, as they were fully committed to the westward push in northern Poland after their communication line was broken with headquarters. This left the area around Warsaw extremely vulnerable, and huge gaps in the line appeared. It seems like every time, so same when the Polish and Ukrainians did it, and then the same when the Russian Soviets did it, the further you push away from, you know, your land, the harder it is to get supplies, uh, the more stretched you get. And therefore, 
you know, you haven't got a solid unit, a solid, solid line. And therefore, the closer you are to your home, it's easier. You've got more supplies. You're able to to bunker down and, and be more solid. And it's just seen, like we've just seen the Poles do it and then the Russians did it. The Battle of Varsha. Meanwhile, Yusuf Polutsky had managed to gather all available troops in Warsaw for a last-ditch defense. Fighting was fierce, and the Polish forces stationed across the Vistula River were gradually pushed back, but Polutsky noticed a major gap in Soviet lines, just south of the city, that allowed him to break through and flank the 16th Army, isolating the 15th Army. It was a resounding success. After 10 days of fighting, Polish forces had inflicted around 60,000 casualties and captured approximately 60,000 more. By contrast, Poland only suffered around 30,000 and casualties. By the time of Tukhachevsky's retreat, he had at most seven divisions left that could fight. But no worries, the 1st Cavalry Army was finally Stalin's on the move to help Tukhachevsky take Warsaw. Yeah, they were a little out of the loop. By late August, the Tonight. cavalry was completely surrounded and realized they were invading Poland all by themselves. What followed was yet another Russian defeat at the Battle of Kamarov, Europe's last major cavalry battle. Just a month later, in late September, Polutsky launched a new offensive, relentlessly driving the Russians back, ultimately bringing the Soviets to the negotiating table. The Peace of Riga was signed on March 18th of the following year, granting Poland parts of Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. Poland would hold on to this territory until 1939, when they were defeated by Germany and the Soviet Union. We know what that invasion there. is more well known for a number of reasons, but we shouldn't let it eclipse the importance of the events we've talked about today. In the early days of communist rule in the USSR, it was genuinely unclear how far the new movement might spread, especially in Europe. Europe's chaotic interwar political climate. If the Polish had not stopped the Soviets' Western advances, the course of European history in the 20th century might have been vastly different. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because yes, you know, Poland constantly throughout history has been that wall, right, between the East and West, basically. And so the you know Poles have got a you know throughout history have got a lot to be thankful for no we've got to be thankful for the polls Ooh, don't want to upset anyone there in this situation though you know it doesn't necessarily say if there was a plan for the soviets to push further further west so you know maybe the polls were a little bit um more worried than they needed to be and and they acted first even though maybe they didn't have to maybe the russians and the soviets did plan on going west and so what the poles did was perfectly right they acted first uh, what i think is amazing though is constantly throughout history that you see how much land changes in that area in eastern europe and central europe you know it is constantly moving for example poland gets bigger smaller bigger doesn't exist bigger smaller it's it's crazy you know and for me coming from United Kingdom, England, for example, where, you know, our borders haven't necessarily, as in just talking about Great Britain or England, hasn't necessarily changed for quite a long time, quite a long time. Uh, it has obviously moved in, in, in stages, but since it became England, it hasn't really changed a lot. And I think we're protected, but it does just seem like the Westerns at the Eastern side of Europe constantly changing and how much is that going to continue through through you know the near future you know we've got the russians for example attacking ukraine at the moment is ukraine going to hold on i'd like to think it probably will uh but if they lose to the russians you know what do the russians then do next what movement is there in land rights and things it's it's crazy it's crazy and, and it's hard for it's hard for someone like me to even comprehend, you know, the wars and, and, and the bloodshed because I haven't experienced it myself. And a lot of the world hasn't. It's scary to think. Um, and I said, I think Western Europe has to be very thankful to the Poles throughout history for stopping this threat, this, this constant, this constant threat by 
Mad Men almost. You know, that's that does seem what it is. But interesting. And I didn't even know this happened. This is the funny thing. I've been learning about Poland now for almost a year. I didn't even know this happened after World War One. Did you? Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate everyone that takes the time out of their day to watch my videos. I am learning. I'm laughing. I'm enjoying my time. If you are from Poland and you enjoy vlogs about Poland, I have got quite a few now of my vlogs with my wife, Charlie, in Poland. So go to Charlie and Rob on YouTube. It'll be in the, in the down below somewhere. And make sure you like and subscribe to that and watch our playlist in Poland. We've just been to Wrocław for New Year's Eve, which was amazing. And we'll be back very soon, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Please do like and subscribe. Do widzenia.